Uh, thank you everyone for, for joining us for today's seminar, which is featuring our very own Dr. India schneider Kreese. Hi, India. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing India for a long time since she was actually a PhD student uh, in, in evolutionary anthropology at Duke University when I was a postdoc and we overlapped there. So uh, India has a BA in philosophy, French language and literature from Stony Brook. And then she got her PhD in evolutionary anthropology at Duke University. After that, she was awarded a prestigious National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellowship, um, which took her all the way to Seattle, the University of Washington, where she was a postdoc in my lab. Um, and then we moved down here. Uh, most of us in the lab moved down here to Arizona State earlier this year, and India was uh, awarded a, a, a Center for Evolution and Medicine postdoctoral fellowship where she's working with me, but also uh, doing a little bit of work on, on the Chimani population, hunter-gatherer population that she'll talk about today. Uh, India has been a very successful researcher with lots of publications, uh, and her, her research sort of sits at the intersection of trying to understand uh, human health evolution, primate evolution, uh, and how interacting with our environments and those parasites that live in those environments um, might affect our fitness or our close primate relatives fitness. Um, so very much within that sort of one health umbrella, which she'll tell us a little bit more about today. Um, outside of research, I guess, as, as part of research, India is, is, is very invested in the broader impacts of her research and uh, is leading the conservation efforts that we have ongoing in Ethiopia, uh, where we study the gelato monkey. And she might touch on this a little bit in her talk or at the end of her talk. Uh, she started the, the nonprofit foundation, Save the Simians, and we institute these uh, monthly and or bi-monthly cleanups where we employ uh, local people to help clean up the park uh, every every month or two. And lastly, sort of a, a fun fact about India. Uh, well, many of us are very committed to our study species. Not all of us are so committed uh, that we will then, you know, wear this on our skin. So India is so invested uh, in, in the parasites that she studies. She actually has multiple tattoos of the ones that she's uh, uh, been working on. So she she constantly likes to think about these parasites and there she's, she's showing off her two of them there. Um, so, you know, maybe all of us can show that sort of commitment to our study species one day. Um, and with that, I'd like you all to uh, welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Schneider Kreese and uh, take it away, India. Thank you. Thanks, Noah. All right, so thank you, Noah, um, for the intro and thank you everybody for coming. Um, so I'm just going to hop right in. Uh, in this talk that I'm about to give you, I'm going to basically provide an overview of three of the projects that I'm working on as a postdoc uh, in the Center for Evolution and Medicine here at ASU. Um, sorry, just fixing this real quick here. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Uh, so it'll be the, an overview of the three projects that I'm working on uh, leading here in the Center for Evolution and Medicine here at ASU or that I've led at previous institutions. Um, and all of these projects are focusing on various components of the parasite host relationship. So I'm a disease ecologist and part of what draws me to parasite host relationships is how deeply interconnected they are. They're impossible to understand in a vacuum. And the very nature of parasite host relationships is really characterized by these complex ecological and evolutionary networks that kind of all interact together to give rise to the shape of every individual parasite host relationship. And my research really focuses on understanding the connection points of the web uh, and how anthropogenic alterations to the web lay the groundwork for uh, zoonotic transmission. My research program is really rooted in a One Health framework that sees zoonoses and infectious diseases as deeply interdisciplinary. So I'm really lucky to be a part of the Center for Evolution and Medicine here at ASU, uh, where one of the goals is to really facilitate these interdisciplinary connections that can shed new light on, um, on these components of human health and disease. I'm interested in both the uh, principles that govern disease ecology, the specifics of zoonotic disease transmission and human health. So as Noah said, uh, I do work both uh, with non-human primate populations as well as humans. Um, and so I'll be talking about projects related to both of those today. The first project I'll talk to you about 
is on the fitness effects of a larval tapeworm in a non-human primate uh, and what that means for zoonotic potential. Then we'll talk about assessing the relative strength of phylogeny and ecology in uh, shaping parasite community structure in that same non-human primate system. And finally, I'll be talking about the immunomodulatory effects of, uh, uh, of that various parasites have and how that affects uh, outcomes with downstream infections with viruses and bacteria um, with implications for understanding COVID-19 outcomes in certain areas. So the first project, I'll, or well, I'll, the first two that I'll talk to you about have to do with uh, the non-human primate part of my work. And the first one uh, within that will be on the uh, fitness effects of larval tapeworms in non-human primates and what that means for zoonotic uh, potential of larval tapeworms. So I think tapeworms are a really fascinating subset of parasites. Uh, and I think they're really cool because for many uh, tapeworm species, they require two different hosts to complete a single life cycle. And often uh, they exploit predator prey relationships to do so. So what this means is that the adult stage of the tapeworm, which is the kind of uh, the, the worm that we think of when we think of a tapeworm, that lives in the gastrointestinal tract of a definitive host, which is typically a carnivore of some sort. Uh, eggs are shed into the ground through feces, and then the intermediate host ingests the eggs while they're foraging, and those eggs hatch and develop into a uh, larvae around the musculature, the viscera, uh, or in the central nervous system of the intermediate host. Now, the larval stage in the intermediate host is arrested in its development here. So it cannot develop, it doesn't have the potential to develop into uh, adulthood in the intermediate host. Uh, in order for the larvae to progress to the adult stage, uh, the infected flesh of the intermediate host has to be consumed by the definitive host. So it's really important to recognize here that the majority of the deleterious effects of, uh, of tapeworms are, are borne by the intermediate hosts, uh, because that's where the actual larvae are going to be growing inside of the body. Uh, and so when we're thinking about zoonotic potential of larval of tapeworms, we should be most concerned about those where humans are infected with the larval stage of a tapeworm. So for example, we have uh, Tania solium. So Tania solium generally cycles between humans in its, in its adult stage and pigs, domestic pigs in its larval stage. So humans, the adult stage and humans shed into the ground in areas with open defecation and pig farming. The pigs ingest the eggs, they develop into larvae in the musculature. Uh, and then humans become reinfected when they eat uh, infected and undercooked pork. And this is kind of all well and good. It's relatively benign to be uh, the host to the adult stage of the tapeworm. And the real issue comes in because Tinea solium has accumulated adaptations that allow it to flourish in its larval stage in, a, in the human body. So when humans ingest uh, Tinea solium eggs that are shed by um, the adult stage uh, in other humans, Tinea solium is able to uh, establish the larval stage in the musculature, which is a condition called cystocercosis, uh, and in the central nervous system, which is called neurocystocercosis. If we look at the global distribution of cystocercosis and neurocystocercosis, which is basically the same, uh, we see that it really does have a, a global distribution with um, concentrated cases in Central and South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and parts of Asia. And it's because of this global distribution combined with the, the really dramatic effects of cystocercosis and neurocystocercosis, which is the leading cause of non-epilepsy related seizures worldwide and can be fatal, um, that tinea solium has really uh, garnered a lot of attention, a lot of research and rightfully so. But this has also meant that other closely related tinea species uh, have been under examined and their zoonotic potential largely unexplored. And so this is where my research comes in. I work in a non-human primate system that is regularly host to a larval uh, tapeworm. So this we have here uh, is the gelata monkey. So gelata monkeys are primates. They're closely related to baboons and they are endemic to Ethiopia and, uh, and the Ethiopian highlands in particular. Uh, 
And you may notice, as uh, kind of if you squint real hard, you may notice this massive protuberant cyst that is descending from her eye down to below her shoulder. Um, and this, if we were to open this up, what we would see, and I'm about to show a picture if you're squeamish or if you're eating, I would suggest maybe looking away or finishing your bite because it's kind of nasty. Uh, so if we were to open up this cyst, what we would see is this. So within this type of cyst, there are multiple small fluid filled bladder packs and then each of these uh, contains these little things that look like little rice grains um, and each of those is a tapeworm larva. And in this type of cystic larval infection, uh, the larvae are asexually budding. So from an initial established infection, uh, you can get multiplication in the host uh, great enough that you would see what we see on the left in this poor female gelata. Uh, so we were able to sample the parasitic material from this cyst and sequence it, and we identified it as Tania cerealis. So Tania cerealis is kind of canonically uh, considered to be a tapeworm of rodents and lagomorphs in its intermediate form. So it cycles between rodents and lagomorphs and the, pred the carnivorous predators of uh, rodents and lagomorphs in, in, the, in its adult form. Uh, so I identified, after identifying Tania cerealis as the agent behind all these massive cysts that we were seeing um, in the geladas, I set out to kind of understand more what the fitness effects were and what the um, dynamics of infection were across this population. All of this work is done as a part of the Simeon Mountains Gelata Research Project, which is co-directed by Noah snyder meckler here at ASU. Uh, the Gelata Project has been collecting biodemographic and, uh, and behavioral data on a population of about 300 gelatas in the Simeon Mountains National Park, Ethiopia, um, for about 15 years. So I was able to draw on these data to look both cross-sectionally and longitudinally at the occurrence of these cysts in the population. What I found was that cysts generally range between, have a prevalence that ranges between 6% and 18% from year to year. Uh, and then I put together that one of the reasons why we were seeing these massive fluctuations in the prevalence of cysts is because cysts have a, a substantial effect on mortality. So what you're seeing here is a plot of the log hazard ratio associated with having a cyst. So on the x-axis, you see age and years. Um, and what we've plotted here is the hazard ratio. So the increase in risk of death associated with having a cyst uh, in dark teal compared to the baseline hazard rate for the population, which is the dotted line at zero. So what you can see here is that there is, uh, there is a significant increase in your hazard uh, of dying, your risk of dying associated with having a cyst. And interestingly, uh, this attenuates with time such that uh, if, you, if you get a cyst when you're younger, you're more likely to die than if you get a cyst when you're older, which is when you're less likely to die. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, in addition to the direct effect of uh, cysts on mortality. We also looked at how maternal cysts influence infant mortality. So again, here we've got age and years on the x-axis, and then we've got the proportion of infants alive uh, for each category. So in the light blue, that's your infants of mothers without cysts, and your dark blue, your infants of mothers with cysts. And you can see that there's a, a substantial difference wherein infants of mothers with cysts are uh, substantially more likely to die than, uh, than infants with healthy mothers. Uh, I also set out to, uh, to assess the impact of cysts on inner birth interval, because as you can imagine, looking at the cyst on the, on the left here, uh, we expect that cysts are enormously energetically demanding as is lactation. However, uh, when I went to do this analysis, I discovered that the effect of mortality was so great that we in fact only had two females who ever survived through multiple offspring. So this really underscores the strength of the impact of cysts on mortality. And I just kind of want to point out here uh, that the mortality we see associated with Tinea cerealis larval cysts runs counter to this idea that crops up in certain conversations um, that parasites writ large should mitigate 
there will inevitably and ultimately mitigate their effects on their hosts uh, because their the parasite fitness is tied up in host fitness. And this is true for many parasites, but um, obviously for a parasite like Tania cerealis, there is actually pressure on the uh, on the parasite itself to facilitate the demise of its intermediate host because it needs the intermediate host to die in order to complete a single life cycle. And all of this to, to say that we should be very intentional when we're making, uh, when we're designing projects, making hypotheses and predictions about parasite host relationships and being really um, intentional with including the specific life cycle and transmission pathway of our pathogen of interest. So all the data I've presented to you thus far has been based on the visual observation of cysts. But we know from other systems uh, and that, that cysts can develop internally. And we also run the risk because gelatas have a lot of hair that we are uh, unable to see certain cysts if they are in uh, places that would be masked by hair. So to, uh, to kind of get around that obstacle, I worked with collaborators at the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp, Belgium, and in the Division for Parasitic Diseases and Malaria at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, to adapt a uh, an existing Tania antigen assay that is essentially able to capture the a product of the parasite, a product of Tania, um, in dried gelata urine samples. And so what you're seeing here is a visualization of the antigen level for uh, individuals without cysts in blue and with cysts in gray, with the dotted line as the threshold for determining positive and negative. And what you'll see is that not only are 99% of uh, the individuals with cysts above this threshold, um, but that we also have individuals without cysts above that threshold. So what does that mean? Well, I implemented this assay across the population and looked at uh, looked within individuals over time uh, to kind of understand what that means. And I'll show you the patterns that we found. So the first is um, that all samples are not infected. So this individual, unlike this female on the left, is completely healthy. Very simple, nothing really to talk about there. Then we've got this individual who gives all positive samples. And this is also pretty simple. So this is, uh, this can be with or without a cyst. And if the individual does not have a cyst, then we take this to mean that there is a cyst internally or somewhere that we are unable to visualize. Uh, here it gets a little bit more exciting. This pattern, we see uh, sequential negative samples followed by sequential positive samples. Uh, and this typically means that we've caught the onset of an infection. So we've had a number of cases with this kind of pattern and typically we see the development of a cyst within um, a few months or a year. But this one is my favorite pattern and it's when we have sequential negative samples followed by sequential positive samples followed again by sequential negative samples. And so what this pattern indicates to me, it's what I call a transient infection, uh, is that there is variation across geladas in their ability to eliminate infections before they are uh, established. And I'll touch a little bit more on that later. So now we know a bit more about the cost and dynamics of infection, but we have yet to talk about what it really means for a primate to be included in a life cycle where the principal intermediate hosts are rodents and lagomorphs. We tend to think about susceptibility in a largely phylogenetic framework. Um, the more closely related you are to another species, the more likely you'll be uh, to be susceptible to the same or similar parasites. And this is why it's no surprise that if a parasite is able to infect a rodent, then it's also able to infect a lagomorph. But it's also why it is a surprise that a parasite of rodents and lagomorphs has included a, a primate in its life cycle. And the uh, driver behind the gelata's inclusion in this life cycle becomes a little clearer when we look at the kind of unique ecological space that the gelata occupies. Gelatas are uh, closely related to baboons, which I told you, but they are also uh, graminivores. So they exclusively consume grasses, uh, roots, and tubers. 
And what this means is that they occupy the same ecological guild as rodents and lagomorphs, and the exposure related to occupying that ecological guild is likely what has led to their inclusion in this life cycle. So this means that susceptibility to larval establishment in a novel host, Furtania cerealis, is driven to some extent, at least, by repeated exposure. So what does this mean about zoonotic potential? Right, we are not herbivores or graminivores. So, what's really our risk of infection with uh, with with Tania cerealis larvae, or uh, the risk of Tania cerealis larvae accumulating adaptations that facilitate its success in humans? Well, as it turns out, Tania cerealis has infected humans. Uh, so, nearly a hundred cases of larval Tania cerealis infection, or Larval tapeworm infection characteristic of Tinea cerealis, but not identified as such, have been identified across the four continents that I have very subtly marked here in red uh, stars. Now, these cases are typically published in, uh, in small kind of esoteric medical journals, um, often in languages other than English. And what this means is that there's really been no synthesis of the cases. Each case is treated as, uh, as just an isolated case and not as indicative of a potential pattern. Uh, in addition, the very nature of where we would expect to see transmission may contribute to uh, our inability to, or the, to the low rates of observation of infection. By this, I mean that we would expect to see transmission at the human wildlife interface, uh, meaning that cases are going to be most likely occurring in rural areas uh, where there, we expect there to be low or no access to healthcare um, or to the complex diagnostics that are required to ID something that isn't really seen as a threat because there is no synthesis of cases. Compounding this issue, the human wildlife interface is expanding. So this map uh, shows the change in habitat degradation between 1993 and 2009. And you can see that the vast majority of, uh, of the world has faced at least mild and up to severe habitat degradation. So this means that humans are in increasing contact with natural habitats in the animals and pathogens within those habitats. Furthermore, when we consider the type of contact that is likely to be going on uh, uh, at the human wildlife interface, there are interactions that are likely to give rise to novel and repeated exposure with novel pathogens. So farming, uh, livestock grazing, and meat consumption. And this kind of contact over time has the potential to exacerbate the danger of the novel emergence of pathogens, including larval infections uh, with neglected tapeworms. Now, aside from zoonotic tapeworms, I'm also interested in the principles that govern parasite community structure as a whole and what that means for host specificity. This next project uh, gets at these principles by leveraging that unique ecological space that gelatas occupy uh, that I mentioned before. When I talk about parasite community structure, I really mean three different things. I mean the parasite species richness, so that's going to be the number of individual parasite species that uh, occur across population. That's going to be the specific identity of those parasites, and that's going to be the prevalence, so the, uh, the pattern of infection with, those, with each parasite across a population. Now, when we think about the major drivers of parasite community structure, we think typically of two things, phylogeny and ecology. Uh, for phylogeny, we, we know that phylogeny has enormous predictive power uh, for certain components of the parasite community, including parasite species richness. Um, and we expect phylogeny to shape parasite communities because uh, you are more likely to share elements of your immune system that make you susceptible to similar things uh, with species that are more closely related. And you're also more likely to share parasites that have long coevolutionary histories within your uh, phylogenetic group. On the other hand, a population's ecology is expected to shape their parasite community species uh, structure versus, uh, oh, okay, I'll take a second. Uh, so we think a population's ecology is another important driver of the shape of parasite community structure because the uh, if you are sharing 
your niche with certain animals, you're more likely with other with other uh, animal species, you're more likely to uh, come into contact with particular uh, infective stages of their parasite community, and thus the more likely you are to share elements of that community um, with the species that you live with relative to the species that you don't share a habitat with. Uh, so we know these are two really strong drivers of parasite community, um, but it's often difficult to parse the relative strength of these two within a single system. But thankfully, we have the gelata. So as I mentioned before, a couple of times, gelatas are primates closely related to baboons, um, but they diverge from baboons and their other closest relatives in significant ways. Uh, as I mentioned before, they're graminivores. So they uh, spend most of their day kind of intimately interfacing with the ground as they graze and as they dig for roots and tubers. And in the Simeon Mountains National Park where we study gelatas, uh, this means that they share a niche not only with, um, with rodents and lagomorphs, uh, but also with a bunch of domestic grazers. So this is gonna be your cows, this is gonna be your sheep, your goats, uh, your donkeys and your mules. As you can see here, the Simeon Mountains National Park has uh, quite a bit of degradation. And so the contact between geladas and these domestic grazers is really quite high. So this really allows us to test the relative strength of phylogeny and ecology in this system, right? We have, uh, we can make a series of predictions of what we would expect to see based on the parasite community of uh, baboons across Africa. Uh, and we could have a potentially conflicting set of predictions of what we would expect to see in the parasite community based on what uh, we see in domestic grazers in this area. So to get at this question, uh, I started off by characterizing the parasite community structure of gelatas. I used two different methods. I used traditional microscopy and I used high throughput amplicon sequencing. Uh, and I focused on the nemobiome which is just the, the section of the parasite community that is uh, just nematodes because they have largely simple life cycles, your straight up fecal oral transmission. So traditional microscopy showed a single egg type and it was this single egg type across 99% of the hundreds of fecal samples that I processed. And this included males and females, this included uh, all different age groups, and this included uh, every different season and across multiple years. And this isn't super helpful because the strongylid egg, egg type is characteristic of an entire order of, of nematodes, uh, strongylida. Uh, and this is where the, the amplicon sequencing comes in. So we were able to identify the species represented by this egg type as trichostrongylus and esophagostomum. So we were unable to resolve this to a species level, so we're just doing everything at the genus level now. And what I'll present to you is uh, richness of the genus level. So I compared this genus uh, richness of, of two uh, to the genus richnesses that are reported for baboons across Africa and for grazers in the particular region of Ethiopia where we study the geladas, um, the Amhara region. And I'll show you the comparison now. So what you'll see here, geladas obviously on the dotted line, uh, is that geladas fall in terms of their genus richness below the range reported for baboons across Africa uh, and at the very low end of the range reported for grazers. So the amplicon sequencing, so all of this to say that geladas have a really enormously constrained um, parasite community uh, relative to baboons and potentially even relative to grazers in the same area, but that habitat sharing appears to be a stronger driver of parasite community structure in geladas than phylogeny. Now the amplicon sequencing also allowed us to get to a, a finer grain, which I'll show you now. So amplicon sequencing can identify amplicon sequence variants, which are essentially individual DNA sequences. We identified 15 of these, um, seven of these mapped to esophagostomum and eight to trichostrongylus. Uh, and I sampled individuals across different populations within the Simeon Mountains. And I found that 
this one site, site number three, had a significantly higher richness of ASVs in the samples that we collected there. And the one thing that is different about this site is that all three of these sites have the same domestic animals, uh, but site number three is the home to the Walia ibex, which is a highly endangered uh, kind of fancy goat-like species um, that actually exists only in this area of the Simeon Mountains National Park. They're so endangered. Um, so what this suggests is that the presence of an additional species, an additional grazer species that's occupying that same ecological niche as geladas, uh, increases the amplicon sequence variant richness, if not the overall genus richness. Uh, and so together with the Tinea data, this really emphasizes the role of exposure as a major driver of host shifts across parasite taxa. Uh, and again, this is particular, particularly salient in a time when, uh, as we saw, the human wildlife interface is expanding and human exposure to parasites of wildlife origin are increasing. I have a few ongoing projects that build on the Tania data and the parasite community structure data that I'll briefly touch on here. Targeting back to those transient infections with Tania cerealis, uh, one of these projects will look at potential sources of that variation. Um, so I'm working with Amy Liu and Jacob Fetter at Stony Brook University, and we'll be assessing whether exposure to early life adversity uh, uh, explains some of the variation that we see uh, based on um, trade-offs in the immune system that affect downstream susceptibility in adulthood. So thus far, we've identified a source of early life adversity in geladas to be the occurrence of male takeovers, which are significantly associated with increased injuries in, uh, in offspring during this really crucial developmental period. Um, next, I'll be looking at the genetics of zoonosis with Noah Steiner-Meckler and Kenny Chu here at ASU. We'll be sequencing the genome of Tania cerealis, which will be the first time it will ever have been sequenced. And we'll, uh, we'll kind of contextualize this uh, within the genomes of other Tania species. Um, and this will allow us to probe the genetic underpinnings of adaptations to generalism or specialism uh, and ultimately zoonosis uh, in Tania tapeworm species. Finally, I'm working with Arvin Varsani and his lab here at ASU to characterize the gelada virome. Uh, and I'm working with Elise Baniel, who is characterizing the uh, gelada microbiome. So altogether, these projects are going to allow us to build this really thorough, really robust picture uh, of the, way, the ways in which multiple levels of the nemobiome, the microbiome, the parasitome, the virome all interact with elements of sociality uh, to shape health and disease in a natural system and how anthropogenic forces uh, end up shaping and modulating these interactions. So I'm going to move on now to interactions uh, between pathogens within a single host. If you have any pressing questions about the past two projects, you can put them in the chat now. I don't want you to forget them. Um, and I'm going to have some coffee. OK, cool. So <clears throat> pathogens elicit different immune responses from the host, many of which can ultimately modulate the outcomes of infections with other pathogens down the line. Uh, the immune system is truly, deeply, endlessly complex, so I've done a bit of simplification here to make it as digestible as possible, so please bear with me. When the immune system encounters a parasite, it mobilizes a suite of cellular activity that differs depending on the type of pathogen among 100,000 other factors. Uh, naive T helper cells differentiate into cells that are generally categorized as Th1 cells uh, or Th2 cells, so T helper 1 or T helper 2 cells, uh, and there are also T regulatory cells called Tregs. These cells release protein mediators called cytokines that essentially polarize the immune response to express a certain phenotype. For viruses and bacteria here on the left, 
Uh, they generally stimulate Th1 cells to release cytokines that mobilize a pro-inflammatory immune response, while helminths here on the right generally stimulate Th2 cells to release cytokines that limit the pro-inflammatory response and Treg cells that limit both Th1 and Th2 activity. Now, humans evolved in a high pathogen environment. For most of our history, we've been evolving alongside chronic infections with helminths and other pathogens. So our immune systems have largely evolved uh, in the context of a high pathogen environment. So what happens when we move to aseptic environments without such exposure? The old friends hypothesis, which is a bit of a updated and expanded hygiene hypothesis, uh, suggests that without chronic exposure to helminths, which as you will remember, regulate the pro-inflammatory response by inducing regulatory actions by Th2 and Treg cells, uh, the immune system is thrown into dysregulation with an overactive and overreactive pro-inflammatory immune response. So that's gonna be Th2. Uh, oh, sorry, that's going to be Th1 being the um, pro-inflammatory phenotype. What's often invoked here in support of the old friends hypothesis is the fact that as nations become wealthier and more industrialized, rates of chronic helminth infections decrease or are completely eliminated, while rates of autoimmune disorders and allergies go up, and those are going to be characterized by uh, inflammation. And reciprocally, the other side of that coin is that uh, rates of autoimmune disorders and allergies remain extremely low in other nations where there are higher rates of chronic helminth infections. So what would this immune dysregulation mean for the outcomes of infections that elicit a pro-inflammatory response, such as the uh, viruses and bacteria that we see here? One of the principal dangers is the development of cytokine storms. Uh, so the danger here is that the pro-inflammatory immune response will progress unchecked. That is that Th1 cells will uh, produce pro-inflammatory cytokines without the regulation provided by the Th2 and Tregs that would be induced by the presence of chronic helminth infection. This type of runaway uh, pro-inflammatory immune response is called a cytokine storm, uh, and it's characteristic of many of the worst cases of viral and bacterial uh, respiratory infections, uh, including the current SARS-CoV-2 outbreak. Uh, and cytokine storms are generally associated with lung damage, uh, multi-organ failure, and uh, ultimately death in many cases. So my question here is whether the presence of chronic helminth infections because of their regulatory properties have the potential to mitigate the ability of the immune response to mount a powerful pro-inflammatory response to viruses and bacteria. To test this hypothesis, I worked with the Tremonti Health and Life History Project, which is co-directed by Ben Trumbull here at ASU. The Tremonti Health and Life History Project uh, works with a population of about 16,000 indigenous Tremonti people in the Bolivian lowlands, uh, who are traditional forager horticulturalists and practice a largely subsistence lifestyle of slash and burn horticulture. The Chimane uh, generally lack access to latrines and water, what, running water, and as a uh, consequence have very high rates of chronic of helminth infections, up to 75% of, uh, of the tested population. The Chimani Health and Life History Project has been collecting biodemographic and health data and providing routine medical care training and support uh, in these Chimani communities for about 20 years. And I was able to draw on these data to test the hypothesis that helminth infection mitigates the pro-inflammatory responses to viruses and bacteria. Specifically, I drew on whole blood antigen stimulations that the project did in 2012. For these in vitro stimulations, participants gave blood samples, uh, and blood samples were separated into multiple al aliquots. One of these was treated with H1N1 vaccine to mimic viral infection, uh, while another was treated with lipopolysaccharides, which are a component of the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria, uh, such as E. coli, which mimic a bacterial infection. After treatment, uh, samples were assayed for 13 cytokines, uh, those that are classically categorized as Th1 or pro-inflammatory, those that are classically categorized as Th2 or anti-inflammatory, and, uh, and the remainder just being others that aren't 
classified in this kind of original paradigm as Th1 or Th2, but can have uh, both pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory um, responses. So what we expect here is that Hellman's infection is going to have a dampening effect on the Th1 specific cytokines and less so on the Th2 specific cytokines. We paired these data with uh, data on Hellman's infection. So Hellman's infection can be a little bit tricky to measure because uh, different Hellman species have different shedding patterns uh, and different maturation schedules. And so you run a high risk of not capturing the true infection status uh, in a kind of point check of a single fecal sample. So to get around that obstacle, we used eosinophils as a proxy of Hellman's infection. Eosinophils are white blood cells uh, that are an integral part of the body's immune response to Hellman's infections. Uh, they are also a uh, part of the uh, diagnostics related to autoimmune and allergic disorders, especially in the US and Europe. Uh, so in the US, when you have an eosinophil count that's above 500 eosinophils per microliter, um, you're typically uh, going to be, your doctor is going to assume that you either have a Helminth infection or that you have an autoimmune infection. But if you'll remember, uh, in areas where there are high rates of Helminth infections, there are low rates of autoimmune uh, and allergic disorders. And this is indeed the case in the Chimane. So I'm going to show you now the distribution of eosinophils across the Chimane. So we have here in the orange line is indicated by the orange line is that 500 eosinophils per microliter cutoff. Uh, indicating eosinophilia in uh, U.S. populations, and you'll see that the average eosinophil count, uh, indicated by the blue line in the Chimane, is about 2,200 eosinophils per microliter. So again, there are few or no allergic or, or autoimmune disorders in the Chimane, and so we take these this kind of population level eosinophil profile uh, to indicate that the eosinophils in this case are, in, are indicators of Helminth infection. And I should note that the results I'm about to show you are robust to a few different kinds of, uh, of, of few different ways of categorizing Helminths, um, but what I'm gonna show you here is the eosinophil data. So I'll first kind of orient you to what I'm about to show you. Uh, what I'm about to show you is the effect of eosinophils on the expression of each cytokine uh, to stimulation with H1N1 and LPS. Uh, the dotted line is at zero, and that would indicate no effect. And if a point is on the right of that dotted line, that means it's a positive effect that eosinophils are having on cytokine expression. And if it's to the left, it, that would be a negative effect uh, that eosinophils are having on cytokine expression. So now I'll show you what that looks like. Oh, and points for women are in blue and points for men are in orange. So what you can see here is that the points are all to the left of the dotted line, meaning that eosinophils are having a dampening effect on the expression of H1N1 and LPS. Uh, Nope, on the expression of these three cytokines in response to H1N1 and LPS. And these are uh, the three canonical Th1 pro-inflammatory cytokines. I'll show you the Th2 now. Uh, as expected, we see less of an effect for both women and men uh, for the Th2 cytokines. And I'll show you the rest of them. For the rest of them, we see a kind of variety of different effects. But uh, at the bottom, you'll note this overall effect where we basically we calculated a meta statistic that averaged the effect of eosinophils on each of the cytokines um, to kind of give a broader view of what eosinophils are doing to the immune system. And it is that they are dampening the response to both H1N1 and LPS. We can also think about uh, about this by looking at suites of cytokine responses. So the Th1 cytokines all together and the Th2 cytokines all together. That's what I'll show you next. For this functional Th1 cytokine suite, uh, we see again that eosinophils are having a dampening effect on the response of, uh, of the Th1 suite to H1N1 and LPS. And there appears to be a stronger effect for women uh, to the LPS in, in the LPS stimulation. And again, recapitulating our previous results, 
there is less of an effect in the TH2 cytokine suite here. So altogether, these results suggest that exposure to chronic helminth infection may mitigate the pro-inflammatory phenotype characteristic of cytokine storms by inducing a regulatory phenotype. When it comes to what this means for COVID outcomes, it becomes a little bit more difficult because there's still so much we don't know. Uh, we're still in the middle of the whole pandemic. Uh, and we also did not test anything with SARS-CoV-2 in this particular study. But our results suggest that areas with high Helminth prevalence may be less susceptible to developing the cytokine storms uh, and their related pathologies than areas with low Helminth prevalence. Um, and this has potential implications for medical decision making about deworming campaigns. At the onset of the current pandemic, the Chimane Health and Life History Project coordinated a massive campaign to disseminate information about uh, COVID-19 prevention strategies among Chimane communities before even the first case was uh, reported in Bolivia. And they're currently, the, the Bolivian team that's on the ground is currently conducting broad antigen and antibody studies uh, among these communities. And they're finding that, in fact, a large swath of the Tremonte communities have been infected or exposed. So they, meaning that they test positive on the antibody assays. However, the case fatality rate among the Tremonte is currently at 0%. Uh, and for comparison, the case fatality rate among um, Americans are in the USA is 2.7%. And Bolivia, unfortunately, has one of the highest case fatality rates right now at 6%. So there are a number of factors that may contribute to these patterns of mortality, such as age structure and obesity across the populations. Um, but it's possible that the high prevalence of helminth infections among the Chimane uh, may be another factor that may be mitigating the worst effects of uh, COVID-19 in this population. I'm working on a few projects that build on this work and reach into other domains. First, I will continue work with the uh, Chimane Health and Life History Project to kind of dive deeper into that variation, we saw where uh, the immunomodulatory effect was stronger uh, in women for some of those cytokines. So we'll look at whether there are uh, uh, hormonal or chromosomal differences by examining the immune response pre and post puberty. Um, and we'll expand to include Tregs here. Next, I'll be working with Noah and Kenny uh, to kind of recapitulate the antigen assay uh, stimulation that we did uh, in the Chimane with samples from gelatas that we have. But this time we'll be assessing whether exposure, whether infection with the larval stage of Tania cerealis has downstream immuno immunomodulatory effects uh, that affect health and disease in gelatas. And finally, I'm a co-director of the Kasanka uh, Baboon Project. Um, which studies kinda baboons in Kasanka National Park in Zambia. And kinda baboons are remarkable in a number of different ways, but uh, one of the ways that I'm most excited about uh, is that they share a space with the largest bat migration in the world, which is also the largest mammal migration. Uh, and so kindas really have this unusual exposure to this influx of millions and millions of bats every year. So along with my co-directors, we'll be examining uh, the ways in which this exposure to bats affects uh, health and disease and the immune system of kindas, um, and all in the name of trying to understand uh, the ways in which bat pathogens emerge in other species, including humans. So with that, I would like to thank all of my collaborators and my funders, without which, uh, without whom and which, I would not be able to do any of this work. And I thank you guys all for listening and in advance for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, single clapper. Wonderful. Thank you. We had a lot of chatter in the chat, so we've got some questions. Um, I am going, you, so please, uh, if you have more questions, put them in the chat or, or raise your hand um, and, we, and we can call on you. Um, I'm going to start with the question from, there were, there were two from Sergio. The first is, how, these are about the gelata section of the talk. How do these parasites survive us chewing them? They have adaptations to survive stomach acid, but I don't understand how they uh, infect us after being eaten. Or do they have adaptations to survive? Uh, uh, no, they do. First, 
for stomach acid. And the a follow up is um, how do we get infected from worms that infect pigs? Are we really closely related? Uh, you said they become zoonotic if the species are close, closely related. So maybe you can sort of tie all those those together. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so great question about how we get infected uh, and adaptations to chewing. So uh, I've had this conversation a lot, actually, and there have been studies that have been done, not published, but done by my collaborators at the CDC uh, to look at how fine grained you can, you can uh, grind up a larval tanid uh, before it really does fracture the integument of the larva. And you can do quite a bit of it. In addition, and again, a little bit of a trigger warning for people, uh, there are certain communities uh, where it is a, a little bit of a delicacy, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, uh, to, to eat. The, okay, so one of my collaborators works with a population who enjoy how it feels to encounter a larval cyst and get to pop it um, and, and then ingest the larvae. So there's a number of different ways that that can happen. Uh, and the question about phylogeny versus ecology, I think that's a really interesting, I mean, I think this is, this is like one of the whole, one of my, one of my major interests is kind of being able to, to, to tease out when phylogeny becomes the most important driver of, uh, of parasitic switches in hosts uh, and when it is ecology. So for, for the, uh, for Tania solium with the, with the pig human transfer, um, you know, we tend to think about parasitic transmission in a phylogenetic framework, uh, but often it is ecological. So in areas where you have humans that are consistently coming into contact with the eggs of uh, the parasites that are being shed by other humans, uh, it, it opens the opportunity for the parasite to start developing and accumulating adaptations that facilitate it flourishing in a new, uh, in a new host. Awesome. Thank you, India. Um, another question from, from Howard is, do older geladas fight off infections better due to a more mature or developed immune system? And does infection of the neurological system produce behavioral changes that make them more likely to be preyed upon? Mm, love that question. Uh, so uh, the first part I don't know. Um, I don't. I don't know what the the time varying effect that we see of cysts is about because by the time we see cysts develop, they're already. Uh, generally adults. We only have a few individuals where we've seen them develop these cysts at a, at a young age when they're still uh, immatures or juveniles. So I don't know, so their immune system should already be developed, um, but this is something that we're going to hopefully explore. And there may be something about inflammaging uh, that plays in to potentially the ability of geladas to live with the, the parasite. We'll see, that's TBD. Uh, and then what was the other? Oh yes, neurological changes. Uh, Tania solium has a predilection for the central nervous system. Uh, so the larvae develop in human brains uh, a lot. Tania cerealis generally is in the musculature of geladas. Uh, and we are often unable to necropsy the geladas to see if there's been, um, if there's been growth in the brain. So we don't really know. But in terms of uh, things that Tania cerealis, cerealis might do to enhance the likelihood of its host being uh, preyed upon, they do slow them down. Like some of these cysts are truly, truly enormous. And, uh, and we've seen our individuals with cysts that become separated from their group. And we have, for geladas, they have these kind of large group sizes that may be adaptations to, uh, against predation. And so effectively separating them from their group because they can't move as fast or they have to eat more uh, to kind of feed the immune response uh, may be part of that, uh, that suite of adaptations that facilitate host death. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to jump around because I know we've only got a few minutes and I'm going to save some of the, the other students for just the other questions for for the, the next 30 minutes. Um, Caleb 
asked a, a specific question about the, the phylogeny versus ecology slides. If, if I understand correctly, richness had to be measured at the genus level. If so, do you believe the weaker influence of phylogeny could be an artifact of taxonomic resolution? That the weaker response of phylogeny could be an artifact of low resolution. Well, I guess, the, let me rephrase that. What was the resolution of the other studies that you uh, compared the gelatos to? It was on the genus level. So everything was compared at the genus level. Uh, many of the, the reports given that I used for this analysis were provided on the species level, um, but because we could only resolve down to the genus level, I uh, then artificially went into all of those studies and pulled out the genera so that we could compare them on that level. So I think actually this is even a more conservative approach. Exactly. Great. So I'm going to save the last few questions that we have for um, the, the next 30 minutes. Although actually, wait, there was one more from, from Howard, which is, is the interplay between pathogens linked to the hygiene hypothesis. Yes. Yeah. The answer is yes. Yeah, the answer is yes. Um, you know, the, the hygiene hypothesis or the, I prefer to talk about the old friends hypothesis because I think hygiene hypothesis has been um, a little bit hijacked and people tend to think of uh, like personal hygiene as the important as an important component of that when really it's um, it's your early exposure during your developmental window when your immune system is developing that's important uh, and but I do think that the removal of entire suites of pathogens that our immune systems develop to combat, really affect the way that uh, that other pathogens um, shape health and disease. 